Hello everybody. You have seen me preach about the construction of a modern hub and why it is essentially a freewheel, a screw-on freewheel from the yesteryear. And you have seen me mumble about uh, rims, you have seen me mumble about how to correctly uh, lace a wheel, and you have seen me talk about equipment for a fat or heavy cyclist. So I think it's time to practice what I preach. And the occasion or the opportunity for this particular purpose is that I have decided to finally go to the dark side and try a one by. Although in reality the reason is that I want to try the nine tooth cog because I have no uh, no experience with those uh, sub 11 cogs so I feel kind of left out and my free ride bike requires well me consuming some stuff because I don't know, reasons. Anyhow, let's just call it the will of God. That sounds much better. Anyhow, uh, this is a hub. Uh, this is a rim. And let's discuss why I chose uh, these two. What you see before you is a Dartmoor real rear hub. There's nothing out of uh, the ordinary about it. It is a simple, fabulous freewheel, which is essentially there are two bearings that load the that carry the load here and here. There are two bearings in the uh, free hub shell, and there's a long piece of uh, of axle that's hanging from from this place. There's a video in the description deciding, uh, describing pretty much uh, this kind of layout of a hub. Anyhow, I have chosen uh, this hub for my particular wheel because I am pushing 100 kilograms, and there are two features in this hub which are very interesting to me and make it a better choice than the one I have. I had as an alternative, which was a Novatec something something full aluminum, because this one has a steel free hub, which is nice, but not really all that important. Although, if this was a uh, HG free hub, that would be very important, because HG free hubs tend to get eaten by cassettes that are not, or aluminum HG free hubs uh, tend to get eaten by cassettes that aren't on a carrier. But all XD cassettes are on a carrier, so that's not really relevant here. However, if you take this cap and you take a look at the axle, you'll notice that it is made of steel. And since steel is much more resilient than aluminum, this means that the bending forces that always occur on this particular hub are going to be less of a problem. So, this is why I have chosen this uh, hub, which weighs almost 500 grams, or 450 grams, I think, instead of uh, 200 grams lighter Novatec 790-something-something-something. There is nothing really special about uh, this rim. It is 32 holes, Alex rims something-something-something. I honestly don't know what the model is, I just looked at the width, which is... 30 millimeters over uh, in the inside and 36 on the outside and has 32 holes. The problem or the thing about uh, this particular rim is that there's nothing all that interesting about this because rim to a well laced wheel is going to work fine even if it's just a very cheap one. However, if you uh, screw up the wheel build uh, then the rim, no matter how great it is, is going to fail. Now, now that we have the rim and we have the hub. Let's select the spokes. As you can see I am using several popular spoke length calculators because in my experience they usually give slightly different results. However in this particular case they all seem to or mostly seem to converge on two values. 272 mm spokes on the non-drive side and 270 mm spokes drive side. Obviously, I intend to follow my own advice, which is using different gauge spokes on different sides of the wheel. Drive side, I intend to use straight gauge 13 spokes, which are 2.3mm thick all the way. And on the non-drive side, I intend to use gauge 14 spokes, also straight gauge, which is a fancy way of saying normal garden variety spokes you can buy in just about every bike shop in the world. And yes, I find it odd that Sapim spoke calculator always seems to give me longer results than the other calculators. Alright, the spokes have arrived. Uh, these are 270 millimeters for the non-drive side, or the, sorry, the drive side. And these are 272 millimeters for the non-drive side. In order to match the color scheme of my bike, these are silver, these are black. This is our hub, this is our rim. Now, 
a quick refresher what I'm actually going to be doing. Someone is using a grinder. Let us presuppose this is the hub when looked from the top and this is a cassette which has umpteen speeds. Now, obviously in order to make the space for the cassette we need to push the spokes on the drive side DS for sure, this is an NDS somewhat to the to the inside of the of the wheel this is the rim this is the rim right right okay so these are our spokes and the angle of approach of the spoke to the to the hub is much shallower on the drive side than on the non drive side and this causes the drive side spokes to work harder Detailed description what's actually happening is in the description of the video. There's a video which I am belly aching about this problem. Now, what I want to do is to compensate for these spokes working harder. And now what I'm going to do is simply use a thicker spokes on drive side and then on non-drive side. What I'm going to be doing is use 2.3 millimeters uh, spokes, 2.3 millimeter spokes on the drive side which gives me 4.15 square millimeters of cross section and I'm going to be using 2 millimeter uh, spokes on the non-drive side which gives me 3.14 square millimeters of cross section. Now this isn't perfectly balanced because in order to make, get a perfect balance between the tension of the non-drive side and drive side I should have used a 1.8 millimeter th uh, thick or uh, millimeter thick spokes millimeters thick spokes however these are more expensive and I am a notorious cheapskate and practice shows that if you use a gouge thicker spokes on the drive side you are going to be essentially golden and uh, in the Anglo-Saxon terms, this is gouge 13, so gouge 13, this is gouge 14, I think, and this is gouge 15. Anyhow, let's make a wheel. Okay, so the wheel is now prepared. I as you can see, I even managed to magically add a tape here. So we're ready to install the cassette, but we're not going to do it yet because I still have to make the axle because in order to make it truly Clyde friendly, we need to make ourselves a custom axle for my bike. Besides, I don't have the proper axle, so for some reason bike discount sent me a frame without the axle. Go figure. Anyhow, let's make it. And unfortunately that's not going to be happening because one, I forgot where I left off so I don't know how to nicely grammatically transition from that particular clip. And two, uh, the machine up there decided to break again. And as you can see I was even working on something that resembles an axle because my point was, it's all greasy, my point was that in order to stiffen the rear wheel for a heavy rider, you also might want to invest in a steel through axle, which is something you'll have to source on your own because obviously cycling has this little bit of an anorexia, doesn't like too much weight, so getting things that are stiff and sturdy but heavy might be a little bit difficult. And obviously the other reason is that it turned out that my cube has a synthase axle and that uses M12 by 1 thread and unfortunately I don't have a die for that but that's going to change in a few days. Anyhow. Intermission from the future. Hello there. I have repaired my machine and I have machined myself with this beautiful stainless steel through axle for my cube and I have actually managed to hit the bike because I tried this several times. Anyhow. This is the axle. I still need to make uh, these bits here because this is a temporary solution. However, you know, the synthase axle on my cube requires this tapered bit here. And I don't have a proper material that isn't a thick bar of aluminum and I don't want to be wasteful. And I'm not going to tell you how I machined this thread here because it's kind of embarrassing. So, I have already tested it. It works brilliantly, as you would imagine, because I'm a genius. 
and well, let's return to the past. Uh, this is my old uh, rear wheel. The sole reason why I invested in the new one is that I wanted this 9 tooth cog which requires me to use an XD driver and this is an HG. This one has been built on a Shimano Saint 810 rear hub I have in my collection of parts since 2008, 2009, 2010, for a long while. Now, uh, the rim is a pretty basic Dartmoor Raider wheel and after three years of being abused, it's uh, this straight. However, uh, this wheel is built identical to the one I just built, which is there are 2.3 straight gouge spokes on this side, there are 2mm spokes on this side, and that's a 32 hole rim. Oh, it has a 32 hole rim and, and the hub. And, as you saw, absolutely nothing happened to it if we discount that it's all caked in, uh, in sealant dried up. I'll have to clean it up before I decide to either sell it or keep it as a spare. Now obviously I'm going to now sound uh, like a like a crazy vegan trying to convince you that you ought to uh, base your diet on a banana. However, uh, these are the wheels I have taken from uh, from my ultimate gravel bike because they are going to be installed on a completely different machine. However, these wheels are also built uh, with the principle I have outlined in mind in, in this video, which is there's a 2mm spokes on drive side, there's 1.5mm spokes on the non-drive side, and as, ma as long as, uh, as wheel building goes, nothing happened to this wheel in the last 4 or 5 months I was riding it. Which is not something I can say about this X Cobra hub because it's using an aluminium axle and if this didn't happen I would make one for my next project for this particular wheel as well. However, I would be making a steel axle which is supposed or I think is going to resolve the issue with this particular hub which is it's chewing uh, the inside bearing of the free hub here. That's the second bearing there and it's already swaying a little bit, which I guess means that it's going to be destroyed soon. And the problem I have outlined in the video before is that just about, oh, there you go. Just about every modern hub has this much of an axle overhang. Discounting Shimano, they have other issues, but I digress. And uh, this essentially means that your rear wheel is well, kinematically equivalent to a free wheel, one that you screwed on here. And the reason why we went to free hubs is that this amount of axle overhang causes axles to bend, or that would happen in the 80s, and nowadays it's going to cause bearings to be destroyed, either on the hub shell on the, or on the free hub, and you are usually breaking the axle somewhere around here. So, one stiff axle in uh, this particular region, which is a stiff axle on the rear wheel. If you are a heavy rider, it's going to stiffen up the rear wheel, stiffen up the rear end of your bike, and resolve that issue as well. Now, you might not believe me when I say that this is something I do, so I'm going to show you my investment in the problem, or in this, in this idea. Uh, this is a wheel from an acquaintance which as you can see has a broken spoke and I'm going to be renovating it with 2.3 millimeter spokes on the drive side because uh, that fellow is also a kind of a big boy. Now uh, this is a front wheel from my ultimate gravel bike and since front wheels with disc brakes are also dished they also need to be compensated. Uh, this one is 1.8 millimeters on this side and 1.5 millimeters on uh, this side. Sorry for the noise, unfortunately it's a rather windy day today and there's a coal mine near this house and it decided to ventilate itself. However, what you see before you is my ultimate gravel bike, although at this very moment I should probably call it the sunken cost fallacy, but it's using my oldest wheel, which is this one here. So here's the story behind this invention and I told you I'm going to sound like crazy vegan. Anyhow, I've been on a vacation on the Baltic island of Borno and I was transporting my 
abundance and my kid on a bicycle because that's the best way to travel on Bornholm and I was uh, carrying her in one of those seats that attach to the seat tube and that would be 100 kilograms of me plus 40 kilograms of her plus the seat plus the luggage and as you can imagine that poor thing I was given hell. I was breaking spokes essentially on a daily and at some point I had foregone I had to find a bike shop because adjusting the wheel with a spoke wrench hoping that it's going to stay kind of operational at some point simply seemed like unreasonable. So I found the shop, I bought the spokes, I repaired the wheel and thankfully uh, the rest of the trip was successful. I broke only one or two spokes I think on the remaining on the reminder of the trip. However, at that point I thought to myself that uh, it's preposterous, it's silly to expect that I'm going to be repairing a wheel every week because at that time I was uh, riding with my kid on uh, each Sunday or every Sunday for a trip. She was on the seat, I was on the bike and I didn't want to get stranded. As you can imagine being stranded in the foreign country was stressful enough but being stranded each week or having a problem each week was out of question. So I started to research the issue and my first attempt was to use a 2.3 millimeter spokes both sides of the wheel and that kind of solved the issue but just made it less frequent because the underlying problem, the dish, the no compensation for that particular dish remained. So I had stronger spokes so they would break less frequently but they would still break. So after relacing the wheel for the second or third time I thought to myself that if I'm breaking the drive side spokes more than the non-drive side I should well use thicker spokes on the drive side and I'm going to finish the story inside because it started raining all right we're inside or I'm inside let me finish my story I'll try to be as terse as possible I laced uh, that rear wheel with a uh, gouge 13 so 2.3 millimeter spokes plain gouge on the drive side 2 millimeter spokes on the non-drive side and I stopped having issues with my wheels while previously breaking a spoke was a regular occurrence, it would happen once or maybe once per two or three months, sometimes more commonly, sometimes less, but it would happen. I stopped having the issue. I haven't gotten a broken spoke for eight years now, with the exception of that particular wheel, uh, because I wasn't as skilled at making wheels, I didn't have the proper tools, so that one is a little bit of an experiment. However, I've been lacing my, all of my wheels and that's quite a few of them, which is kind of scary. But I've been lacing my wheels in that particular fashion since then and I haven't gotten a broken spoke yet. So as you can see, it might be a coincidence or I might be onto something. And as I outlined in the long and boring video that's in the description about this subject, there is a little bit of a mechanical underlying uh, principles that make it work. The minor exception is uh, that wheel which was a quick hack job and it shouldn't happen but it did and I'm going to be repairing it uh, as we speak. Anyhow, now the other things I was mentioning in this video, if you're a heavy rider because, okay let me uh, backtrack a little bit, I told you I'm going to rumble. Uh, compensating the dish of the wheel is something that every rear wheel at least should have been well, should be implemented in just about every wheel out there which is dished. Unfortunately, the cycling base doesn't do this because I'm not going to go into that particular rant. However, all the other things I was mentioning... No, let me backtrack once again. If you, have a, uh, if you want to have a wheel that's sturdy and lightweight, you need to compensate for the dish because that allows you to use really thin spokes where they are actually necessary use a thicker spokes when they are needed and you have a stronger wheel but uh, optimized for its weight. Now I, need, I can finish my thought. Other things I was mentioning are really quite of importance for uh, heavier riders because uh, uh, chromoly axles, chromoly through axles, which you need to source on your own, and other things make uh, the rear end of the bike, which is laden the most, 
much stiffer. Now the wheel I was bragging about before always used a chromoly thick axle, so I never had an issue with that particular hub. Uh, that particular thing is kind of an experiment because it's still riding on its original bearings, that's 40,000 kilometers. They are kind of crunchy, but recently I have uh, repacked them with grease. I have heated them, so they uh, I flushed the old grease, put the new one, and it's good as new. No, not really, it really isn't. Anyhow, uh, chromoly axles stiffen the rear of the bike, which allows uh, the rear to track better and bend less, which uh, solves the issues of the axle overhang. So. In essence, if you're making uh, a wheel for a, if you're making a wheel, make sure it's uh, compensated for a dish. If you're making a wheel that was that is supposed to carry a significant load, so a touring bike or a heavy rider or a tandem, make sure to use thick spokes and make sure to use uh, chromoly axles, chromoly through axles, and make everything as stiff as possible because cycling anorexia is something that you're not supposed to be falling to. And I almost forgot, uh, this is my cube in its current incarnation, 1x11 drivetrain, 9 to 42 cassette, and the rear wheel we have just built.